Uh, Klaus Martin, Martins is the author of, and I'm, round, I'm just rounding this off now, of about a dozen books of poetry, of his own poetry, uh, about a dozen or, or more scholarly uh, books, and another uh, dozen or so books of translations uh, from German into English, including uh, work by the Nobel laureates Derek Walcott and Joseph Brodsky, also <clears throat> Dylan Thomas, Wallace uh, Stevens, and uh, even Edgar Allan Poe. I don't know of any other German uh, poet translator who has done more to bring uh, English-speaking poets into German. He lived and studied for many years in America, including uh, fellowships at Harvard and Yale, and he taught for a while at Reed College in Oregon. And then he uh, had a long career as professor of North American literature at the University of Zarland. I've known him for nearly 15 years, uh, but until fairly recently, only a few poems of his were available to me in English. The last two issues of Terminus magazine, which is now sponsored by Poetry at Tech, featured poems of his translated by Muriel Cormican, a professor of German at the University of West Georgia. Klaus did a reading and a talk there yesterday. And his publisher in Germany published just recently this book, uh, 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 A Restatement of Dreams, which is uh, mostly in English. There's some facing uh, text in here. This is one of the books that's uh, free. Every one of you should have gotten uh, either Miha's uh, book or Klaus's book or a couple issues of uh, Terminus magazine. Uh, we want to put a free book in uh, everybody's hands. Uh, Klaus is primarily a lyric poet, though often the lyric meets the narrative in a kind of borderland of intense emotion and a kind of colloquial storytelling. It's, a, it's almost uh, it's sweetly jarring. His poems are lucid but with an air of strangeness, something quietly atilt. There's a poems, there's a poignancy in his poems in English. He knows how to celebrate and how necessary it is to celebrate the great light of the world, but he also is acquainted with the world's darkness. I hope more and more of his poems appear in English and in America, uh, and I'm going to do whatever I can to uh, see to that. Please, please welcome Klaus Martins to Georgia Tech. Isn't he a sweet man? <laughs> to say all these undeserved nice things about me, okay? Now, we've known each other for 15 years, as he says, when he first came to Germany at my invitation. But I've translated some of his poems uh, as early as 1989, 1990, okay? So his fame had preceded him to Germany for <laughs> at least nine, if not 10 years. Um, recently, we were able to uh, have, a, have an issue of a rather well-known magazine uh, with his friendly face on the cover and much of his materials on the inside in translation and uh, a few essays and uh, opinions about him, a review also of a bilingual book. Uh, well, it's actually a chapbook. Um, of his poems, also in my translation, was sold rather well and sold to excellent reviews. Uh, everybody know, knowing Tom's poems won't be surprised by that. Okay. Now, he stole most of my introductory patter uh, referring to my book here. Um, it's not as small as it looks. It's very, <laughs> it's, it's very thin paper. <laughs> Okay, uh, and I'm not all that blue as it, you know, seems to be here on the cover. Um, it's a it's a shadow image, uh, a photograph uh, taken by my daughter and showing my daughter's shadow uh, ten years ago on a ferry to Sweden. And what you see here with those faults uh, uh, on the cover, are actually the faults on the metal deck of the ferry to Sweden. That should explain it. It's not that we have such bad printers back home. <laughs> okay. um, 
I'd like to begin with a poem that uh, also appears on the back here. Um, I think it's fitting because we'll also be including uh, two translations, Tom Wright. Okay, Tom is going to participate in that. Um, and this is, as he said, my first book uh, in English. Um, I always, since English is more or less my second language, I've been writing poetry in English too all the time, but didn't, but didn't feel safe enough really to publish them. And then he really put the pressure upon me and said, you would have to read all in German, nobody would understand a word. So, um, so I put this little collection together and my publisher was nice enough to rush it through the press, uh, mistakes included. Um, it's called The Restatement of Dreams, but I like to read the poem on the back. It says, and I think it sort of fits our agenda tonight, uh, it's called a Foreign Language. Actually, it's not really foreign. Okay, some things are different. But with a little practice, you'll understand, you think. But the sleepwalker's feeling of rightness, one word put in front of the other, doesn't kick in. The, the required unawareness while speaking is absent. The feeling for the situation with the skin, not the brain, in spite of all mistakes, correct. Of course, you are infallible. You think in your country, because it never speaks with an accent. <laughs> the title of this book is taken from a poem with which I begin it here. So somewhat pompously called The Urge, The Urge. Uh, only other title with that word, I think, uh, was a song by Judy Collins. Uh, <clears throat> the Urge. The Urge to settle down, to finally, finally settle down. <clears throat> the sunny street in a fragrant suburb with a sweet countryside the renovated shack with most comforts, the barn for her art and yours, a grove of hickory and a meadow for the kids and their animals, maybe even a brook of your own with whose babble all are conversant. The urge to settle down never leaves you as you leave another approximation of your dream for the next. The urge remains and comes again, for moving is what really moves you, the restatement of dreams. Well, over our early dinner, tonight, but feed you a wonderful Chinese dinner. Envy us was just wonderful. Uh, we talked about uh, archaeology in certain parts of Germany, where also Georgia Tech now has a small campus uh, in Metz, I understand. And this whole region is wine-growing regions where I also live, Trier, Saarbrücken, and so on, Metz. Uh, this is old Roman territory. Um, in the valley near where I live, we have a little plot of lands where the kids used to play. And when they played, and this actually happened, you know, they, they dug up the occasional coin from the earth. Okay, that saturated it is. Not only with money, but also with blood. Okay, so you expect antiquities on the hill. There, on the hill, surrounded by age-old vineyards, on the rugged trail between a theater, gone, an absent garrison, there must have stood a marble statue of Constantine, the emperor, though there are no ruins left, no buried stones or iron clamps, 
No well-formed mighty nose, no ears, no helmet left to show off grandeur long ago. It would have been a good place, I know. They must have known. They certainly must. But they did not even cast a bust. Constantine and so on. Death of the Heroes is the title of the next poem. What happens when the heroes die? So many died recently, at least those of my generation, especially singers. What happens to the nameless when one after the other the immortals die? When the role models fall off the inner walls, the idols drop from the hymn books, the fixed stars disappear into the abyss of the aged heart. What happens when all that's left are the voices conserved in the ear until, until they too have faded and won, alone with a mute soul, has to pipe up against the void. Sad, sad. Let's have, have some little cruelty here, okay? Next point. To you I pray. To you I pray. Now that I'm fast asleep, take my heart into your hands and ease away along life's crusts. Open, please, now what's closed. Give it back to me right now. It is already late. The wound has to be stitched. But first, let blood flow through again. And do give back the mystery. Anybody here with heart surgery? Okay. Three rather personal poems. As we get older, Tom knows this too, and other poets that I know, we tend to look back a little and get a little autobiographical, um, which in my case, uh, as a German, born in 1944, has a certain slant, of course. So bear with me. The first was called, aptly, I think, in a time of war. I was told, and I like to believe, I was conceived in much love on a large gray rock covered with Iceland moss and purple heather. And I recall every time they told this, they smiled. Late summer day, high above a fjord in Norway, the afternoon sun warms them, my parents to be. There's a cooling breeze from the blue green water below, the sky mauve and high. Well, that's what I was told. And they must have believed it. But I was born in September. <laughs> Delivered by a passing doctor in black boots in a wayside inn in Germany. Bombing squads passing over us and the clattering vehicles of the fleeing on the road outside. So, I tell you, and I have to believe it, it must have been a green ice day around Christmas, probably, in Norway. 
every body buttoned up. Occupiers, my people, and resistance, their people, still, and not very much else moved, I'm sure. So what happened? Now, as I conceive it, there must have been an army Christmas party at the office in Oslo. <laughs> and they were lonely and in love. But I, I still love the mosses. The purple heather on the rock above the cooling fjord below. <sighs> One more. Survivor. Well, I'm getting this English accent all of a sudden. Survivor. <laughs> My father survived two wars, built himself two worlds, then died of exhaustion or whatever the natural cause assigned to him. Then, nobody mentioned shell shock, disgust or blank horror, or icy winters as reasons for early burnout. A person didn't suffer burnout. He burned or he was burned. He died or didn't. If not, he survived. That is, he lived. That is, he worked and built yet another world. This one he didn't see. Just the building materials. Anger, sleeplessness, broken health. Still, my father was lucky that posted him in Norway, writing for a paper, transporting provisions from Sweden. He was spared, I guess, the Russian horrors and the horrors of the camps, and he never denied his early high hopes. A common feeling that comes before disillusionment and death. Thus he shared a common fate. One more of that series? Can you stand it? Sure. There'll be something funny later. Okay. Okay. <laughs> after it was over, after it was over, I began. The neighbor's wife had stopped speaking to men. The other neighbor killed rats with a shovel. A man we knew disinfected his bleeding feet with booze. A girl with a brown baby was cut in three by a train. First I remember, it's a carbon in a ditch. Bobby, the black dog, was run, was run over by bus number eight. While still alive, it was fed fried potatoes. I adored the full moon and called out, Mama! I fell off the bed, my arm in a pot with boiling water. After I did not die, I got home and found a brother. My father unloaded American ships. I grew strong on egg powder. When I started walking, there were men without eyes, jaws, arms, and legs. We played self-forgetfully in the rubble and the new sand. My father was not a very brave man, but he wasn't stupid either. My parents had survived. They had become hard, smiling. Later I learned of what happened all around me while I was born. I was taught to do the repenting. Out in the world, I stood out. I guess you become what you can, not what you're supposed to be. There's an old world behind me, how much it resembles the new. How I long to be home again, the place that stole itself away from me. I spend much of my time up in Connecticut and Massachusetts. And summers, I love to go swimming in Walden Pond near Concord. You know, they have this replica of his hut 
his, you know, David Henry, who called himself Henry David Thoreau. And uh, all sorts of people run around there, even in the dead of winter, looking for something. But there's something else, and that's what this poem is about. It's called Here Lies Henry. There's a stone engraved only with its first name. A granite headstone, gray and unassuming, almost smothered in large pine cones and evergreens, pebbles piled on top of each other, adding another head to the marker, marking the thoughts of, as they say, Henry, by so many passers-by. I understand they become so many in the course of the daily visiting hours, they have to be regularly removed. Where do they store them, <laughs> I wonder? These huge piles of thoughts of him, which must be as large as Henry's diaries. <laughs> How am I doing as far as time is concerned? And go on. Okay, good. Um, here's an American one. At the end of this trip, we passed by Woodstock, and it was such a disaster that we went on driving. We loved the music, but it, it really was a disaster. <coughs> being idealized today. August 1969. <clears throat> One evening in August 1969, we stopped for the night off a road near a pond somewhere in Iowa. Now, <clears throat> that was a mistake. The mosquitoes were as big and brazen as Apollo 11. <laughs> Remember? At liftoff time. And the biggest campfire couldn't keep him away. We fled into the seeming safety of our van's cabin, but the skiers followed. Neither could run away from the other. Boy, were they swollen with our blood. We expanded in spots where they stung. It was an uneven battle, and it was the only show down that night in central Iowa, which certainly is a bum place for poetry, but humming with thirst. <laughs> Here's a topical one. You've heard about the exodus of all those Africans, these desperate Africans uh, trying to get into Europe especially uh, to Italy, or its various small islands between Africa and uh, Sicily. In the Mediterranean, when the African boat capsizes, spilling people of all ages, the hull, not quite like a sponge, but porous, under layers of old color. So when it finally capsizes, and midmost midnight it still is, black in every direction of the missing compass, then the many kinds of fish and jellyfish come to inspect and touch the warm bodies treading water. Yes, even the dolphins who are said to have saved mariners in the lore of ancient times. Sharks? Are there sharks? So when the boat capsizes, which was to be expected and feared, the hope which sailed the ship is the last to leave, which doesn't save it either. In the morning, she, lay, she lies dead among all the others on the sand, and not quite whole from the nibbling it took.
must poetry be this gruesome? Sometimes. Okay. The next one is called Rough Nights. It's a tradition in Austria and in southern Germany uh, in the 12 nights after Christmas. You know, they dress up in weird costumes and uh, wear awful masks. If you're not prepared for that, you might get a heart attack sometimes. And they yell, you know, and make obscene gestures, and sometimes they're successful. You know, rough nights. Whatever may happen, and something is going to happen, you cannot foresee it. Four nights or twelve, something assumes a new shape, comes in, steps out of time. Man becomes woman, becomes man, becomes child. Whatever comes, comes unexpected, but something is going to happen. Snow at last comes in with the frost into the dark of the end, the beginning of the old new time. It shows itself behind stark masks. It pulls your hair and nose and ears. Everything is as it is in its own way. The days are rough. Rough on man and animal, the way they have always been. The way they are from child to crone. Something's gone. Too much has happened. Oh, the distress from birth to death. And many people here who speak German, so anybody here who speaks German understands German? Uno, dos, tres. Oh, pretty good. Uh -huh. All right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Tom, would you support me? Okay. Uh. We're just going to read, uh, I'm going to read two poems of uh, Klaus's in English, and he's going to uh, read them in, in, in German, although I can't, I don't think I can read his poems in uh, English uh, any better than he can, but I like to. Uh, we've done this before a few times. Uh, how about I'll, I'll read uh, Daughter Leaves, uh, you read it in German, then uh, uh, you, you'll read uh, uh, I Love. Let's end with a love song. Yeah, uh, okay. I, I'll read in English, then you read it in, in German, and I'll, meanwhile I'll have sit and sat down. Okay, okay. And then I'll step down, you do the introduction for... Yes. Okay, yes. very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> daughter leaves, but a, a daughter growing up and leaving. So many of us can, uh, can relate to that. <laughs> daughter leaves. Horses heed her. With teetering gait, the schooled horse nods and nods. Has already understood. Here, the apple sits down, surrounded by horses like trees in a forest of legs. They flex their insteps and sniff treasured throng, loose lips pull on a strand of hair. Father calls, the animals scuttle away. I scuttle to your side. Tochter geht. Pferde folgen ihr. Im Schaukelgang das Schulpferd. Es nickt und nickt. Schimpfgriffen, jeder Apfel. Setzt sich nieder von Pferden wie Bäumen umstanden im Beinwald. Sie beugen die Riste und <lacht> schnuffeln. <lacht> Gunstgedränge, lose Lippen ziehen am Haarstrang. Vater ruft, die Tiere stieben davon. I have told Klaus this before, but I grew up in a, a, in a house where German was spoke, spoken uh, routinely, but, and I knew a little German as a child, uh, but I lost it all, of course. But m when I've been in Germany when I, and I hear Klaus read, there's just something about, I don't know, something comes back to me. There's something comforting about it. Maybe I mostly heard it in my grandmother's kitchen or something like that, or uh, with family. But uh, there's something about the, the cadences of, of, of German 
the German language that I that moves me. I love, I love your familiar body, your hair, and your face. Experience lives in your wrinkles. The courage pulses steadfastly in your chest. You keep yourself well. You are impish and speak, you stout woman, so colorfully and candidly. Your words weave wreaths for you in the moment that you speak them. Chapped gardener's hands, callous toes, the knowing hold on books and herbs, and the little child's uncertain hand. If you speak loudly, I still hear your soft-spokenness, the scratching at the door that is let in the hushed desire. If you press hard, it hurts me. And in my years, when all the firmness of my body leaves me, and I am lacking, if not in words, then in renunciation, will my power have retreated into jest? I give you all my silver on my tongue. Does it sound bright? It is in this light that we want to persist. <coughs> I couldn't do any better than that in German. No. I read another poem. <laughs> in German. <coughs> Vespa, Vespers. Um, I spent many evenings in Toronto over the years. And those of you who have been there probably know St. James. And since it's near Lake Ontario's blue shore, uh, you know, evening mists are rather common. One <coughs> evening I had seen a movie with Bruce Willis and was still worked up. <laughs> <laughs> so I sort of left and went to the next burger joint around the corner. And picked up one and a few uh, chips and uh, sat down on the bench in a nearby park. And this is what it's about. And I'm not going to read it in German, but in English. The warm, wet wings of the evening sink semi-transparent silver and gray down along the towers of St. James in Toronto and onto the trees of the almost abandoned park, not far from this bench. Back from the movies, my dinner in a plastic bag, next to me on the seat, a bolt of lightning penetrates the hovering haze and lands a little bit in front of me. All this twirling the striding, the stare. She is my seagull. Still unfamiliar, but mine. She found me, one among all the others who are not eating. I'm her friend and must share everything now. Here a crumb and another one. Further bolts alight. My seagull cranes her neck horizontally, opens her beak, and speaks loudly. We want to be left alone. We, friends for the infinity of our vespers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus.